So by show of hands, how many of you are hosting Thanksgiving this coming up week? You getting your house ready, getting the turkey thawed? Just a few of you. How many of y'all are traveling for Thanksgiving? How many of you, when I say you're getting together with family, that strikes fear and anxiety into your life, right? When we think about Thanksgiving, we think about the fun, the food, the football, and the family. And some of you, you go, the family, and some of y'all go, the family, like we've got cousin Eddie coming over and and he's bringing his RV and he may stay for a month. It's chaos because here's, here's the true truth for us this morning. If you have more than one person in your family, there's turmoil, there's conflict, there are disagreements. When you have family, it comes with baggage. When you have differing opinions and backgrounds and, and approaches, it comes with a little bit of conflict. And so when you think about family, it may bring up all kinds of excitement and anticipation, or it may bring fear, or even maybe this is the first Thanksgiving where there's going to be an empty chair at the table, or maybe that person's still alive, but they're not going to be home, and that's, that's difficult. And maybe there's going to be people that are going to come to your house or to a house and sit around the table that they don't talk to each other except on these occasions. And when we think about the fact that we've been in a family series all fall, whether we're dealing with marriage or parenting, we're going to end it today with what happens when family falls apart. What happens when there is conflict? What happens when there's relationships that are broken or strained? What happens when you have divorce or what happens when you have a prodigal child? If you're new to church, there's a story in Scripture that Jesus tells about a, a son that basically says, forget about what you've taught me, Dad. Forget about how you've raised me. I'm going to do, do my own thing. And we call that a prodigal child, one that has left the way that he or she has been taught, the, the foundation of who you are, to go into the distant country and live a life for self. And some of us understand that all too well. Some of us have been coasting through the parenting series because your kids are out of the house, but this is going to strike a chord because you understand what it means to parent a prodigal. When family falls apart, maybe a fact that you and a sibling haven't talked since last year, and you may have to have a conversation this week. Family falling apart may be the fact that your marriage right now is crumbling, and you need to figure out what to do. When families fall apart, there are two things that we cannot, must not do. And there are four things that we must do. Four things that we, if we're going to be a a family built on God's principles, his truth, his word, then we have to approach with these four must do's. So first, the two don'ts. The two things that we cannot do when we have issues in our family is don't battle alone. First of all, do not battle alone. In fact, your pride is gonna keep you from healing or reconciling a relationship. Don't let pride and the fear of what others think keep you from seeking help. In fact, a lot of you right now are thinking you're the only one in this room parenting a prodigal. You think you're the only marriage that's having frustration or difficulty. And that is a lie that is trying to keep you from getting the help needed. Do not battle alone. We are called to live in community. We are called to live out Galatians chapter 6 verse 2 that says this, bear one another, uh-oh, bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. We are to carry one another's burdens. We are to walk with one another through the difficult times in life and that includes parenting a prodigal or walking through a disobedient parent or sibling or spouse. That means that when we struggle with relationship issues, we reach out instead of being inclusive and hiding those things. If you are parenting a prodigal by yourself, you're being disobedient to God's word. If you are walking through a difficult marriage by yourself, and keeping everything hidden and posting everything on social media like everything is just perfectly great, then you're living in disobedience to God's word. God has placed you in a community. He has people around you who have not only walked 
through the path that you're walking through right now, but want to love you and encourage you and get, speak life into you. So find that person, find that couple, find that counselor, find whatever or whoever it is that can help you grow and reconcile and seek, seek building into your marriage, into your family, into your children, instead of tearing it down. Do not let pride get in the way of seeking to walk through this difficult time with someone who's gonna encourage you. And not only do it, but do it quickly. Do not delay seeking help. I think oftentimes we go, it's bad now, but we're gonna wait for it to get a little bit worse before we seek counseling or seek help or seek a couple that can pour into us or go and just pour out where our struggles and our frustrations about our prodigal, when it gets to this point, then we'll get help. And then tomorrow, when it gets to this point, we'll get help. If you wait and wait and wait till it's absolutely destroyed, then it's beyond sometimes the help that you need. I think about our cars. Think about when a check engine light comes on. You can either go get that fixed or you can put a piece of black tape over it and you'll never see it again and just ignore the issue. When you hear that knocking or the rattling, you can either go get it checked out or you can just turn the radio up, all right? There are two approaches when you see little things occur that might need issues or might need really help and assistance. If you want your car to last 200 or 300,000 miles, as soon as you see the first sign of an issue, you get it checked out. If you want your relationships, if you want your families, if you want your marriage to be one that lasts and thrives, at the moment there's the spot, just, just the inkling of an issue, you seek counsel, you seek help, you seek reconciliation immediately. And when you seek that and you don't walk alone, you don't bear that burden alone, if you're gonna seek professionally, professional counseling, Seek Christian counseling. Secular counseling, some people go, well, counseling is better than nothing. Sometimes not. I've seen secular counselors do more harm than good. Why? Because they worry about your feelings more than they worry about the truth found in God's word. They're worried about things like happiness and ignore holiness. They're worried about what's gonna build self-esteem instead of what's gonna build character and, and biblical principles. So if you seek counseling, and I, and I promise you, counseling is an excellent thing. Make sure it's biblical Christian counseling. Do not battle alone. When you're dealing with a, a, an issue, do not walk through that alone. Swallow the pride. Ignore the fact that you think everyone's going to think negatively of me. And you say, I need your help, I need your prayers, I need your support, I need your counsel, I need your guidance. I need a support system around me that's gonna bear my burdens and therefore fulfill the law of Christ. Do not battle alone. Find someone that you trust, find someone that's gonna love you and encourage you and pour into you God's truth, his word, his love, and his guidance. The second thing, is you don't blame yourself. You don't blame yourself. Now, that's not dealing with maybe a marriage that's struggling because in a marriage that's struggling, I would, I would challenge you, the, the scripture that Bradley read for us this morning, to search me, oh Lord, see if there's anything in me that's unclean or un impure. And I wanna build in my relationship. How can I grow my, but if you have a prodigal and that 18-year-old or 28-year-old or 48-year-old is walking and living their own life. It's not your fault. Go back and, re and, and reflect on your parenting. Did you raise them in God's truth? Did you pour into him or her God's love and his forgiveness and his truth? Did you encourage them to build a life of integrity and work ethic and things that, that you know you should have done as a parent? No parent is perfect. When you reflect on your parenting, there's always gonna be, oh, I wish I could have tweaked that. I wish I could have set bigger parameters in this and maybe given a little bit more grace in this area. I, I wish that I could have approached this differently. That's understandable. But when you have an adult and they know the truth and they choose for themselves to walk a life of disobedience, if they choose for themselves to go to the distant country, 
the parable of the prodigal. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. Look at Romans chapter 1, verse 28 says this, and just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer. Some of you have a prodigal child that is not acknowledging God any longer. They have once in their lifetime, but with their lifestyle, maybe with their words, with their thoughts, with who they are, they are not acknowledging God. God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are no longer proper. Then he lists a few things, and in verse 32 he says this, and although they know the ordinance of God, they know it. You as a parent know that they know it. You taught it. You've demonstrated it. You modeled it for them. They know it, but they're not acknowledging it and they're not doing it. That those who practice such things are worthy of death. They not only do the same, but they give hearty approval to those who practice them. It's not your fault. If you think that having a prodigal child makes you a bad parent, then God is a bad parent. Because the first relationship we had in creation, God the Father had Adam and Eve. He set for them parameters. He showed them they had perfect fellowship. And what did they do? They went prodigal. They went ahead and decided to sever the relationship. God didn't blame himself. He didn't say, I should have given them more options. No, God said "There there is a right way and a wrong way since you chose the wrong way there's gonna be a consequence. In fact, God kicked him out of the house. And he said, you know what? You chose to disobey and to live a life for your own selfishness. And because of that, there's a severed relationship. God didn't blame himself. He didn't beat himself up over bad parenting. He didn't allow the guilt of a prodigal child to change the way that he thought and act, acted. You look at throughout scripture, there is time and time again that good parents who teach God's word, who model that behavior, have children who go off to the distant country. It's not your fault. I know in a room this size, there may be hundreds of parents who are walking with a prodigal child. It's not your fault. Live in the freedom and the forgiveness that you may have made mistakes as parents, but it's not your fault. Some of you may be the product of a divorced family and for years you've been walking around with the guilt that you as a child did something to your parents. It's not your fault. What your parents did, their decisions, their path, they chose, you didn't. So as a child, if you're the product of a divorced parent, understand it's not your fault. When we have family issues, sometimes we have something, some input. Sometimes we allow our actions, our attitudes to influence those relationship issues. But if it's the product of a divorced family or the fact that you have a prodigal child, we need to rest in the fact, the freedom, the forgiveness. It's not your fault. And trust God. Now, that's what we don't do. We don't battle alone. We don't hide it based on our pride and the fear of what other people are gonna think. And we don't beat ourselves up. If we look back and we say, God, search me. I know I wasn't a perfect parent, but did I teach God's principles? Do they know God's truth? Then it is up to them to live it. We don't blame ourselves. Four things that we must do. And I know that we have family issues. I know that we have cousins and uncles and parents and children and siblings that are doing their own thing. Here's our approach. First of all, pray. Pray daily for that prodigal. Pray daily for that parent. Pray daily for that sibling or that relationship. If you're in a marriage that seems to be crumbling, pray daily for yourself to be the man or the husband or the the wife that God wants you to be. And pray for your spouse. Pray every day. Pray because there's power in prayer and pray for that prodigal child for a person or a circumstance to get in their life, to intervene in their life and to make them come to their senses. When you read that parable, you see that there there was a light bulb moment for that prodigal son. There was a light bulb moment and it wasn't the fact that the, the father sent provisions as he was off in the far country eating with the pigs. 
It wasn't like that he sent his servants to go retrieve the son and bring him back home. That father sat at home praying for that son, for people or circumstances. You know what a circumstance was? He hit rock bottom. And see, today we see our prodigals and we see them walking away from God and we see circumstances and and really the natural circumstances that might come from their actions and we want to rescue them, but they may have to hit rock bottom before they come to their senses and return home. We pray as parents for our kids, for, for people to surround them that are godly influences. I pray weekly for my boys that they would have a godly band of brothers to love them and encourage them to grow in Christ. And we pray for those circumstances. And the hardest thing you may pray for as a parent, parent is that your child has to hit rock bottom before they come to their senses and come home to Christ. And that's tough because we would rather rescue then pray for rock bottom. But we pray and we love them. The second thing that we do is we love. We pray daily and we love unconditionally. Now hear me, the culture has tried to redefine unconditional love as unconditional embrace and endorse. Unconditional love isn't unconditionally accepting the way that people think, the way that people act, the way that people behave, and the way that people are are heading their life directing their life. Unconditional love means that you have difficult conversations. Unconditional love sometimes is best expressed in tough love. Unconditional love isn't embracing every belief and thought that someone has. In fact, unconditional love sometimes is telling someone the path that you're walking is a path headed toward destruction. Unconditional love means loving someone enough to tell them when they're heading down the path of destruction, when they're walking away from God's truth, when they're walking away from God's plan for their lives. Unconditional love is what we're called to bring to our families, not judgment. But there is a difference between judgment and making a judgment. See, when you judge someone, you're looking at them and condemning them as a person. When you're making a judgment, you're doing what is best for the circumstance. What is best, not only for your prodigal son, but your family at home. I would say Thanksgiving is one of those difficult times. If you have a bunch of of young children and you've got a sibling or an aunt or an uncle or, or someone who is living in the distant country, they're living a lifestyle and making decisions that do not honor God or point your children in the, in the position of God's pathway. You may have to make a judgment that, hey, you can come, but they can't. Hey, you can come, but you're gonna have to sleep in separate bedrooms. I still laugh. My uncle was, he was an adult probably in his 40s, and he had a girlfriend, and they were living a life, and my granny and papa, they lived basically in, a, in, a, in an RV by the lake in Tennessee. And my uncle and his girlfriend came to spend the night with him and stay, and there was two twin beds, and my, my papa and my uncle slept in one twin bed, and my granny and his girlfriend slept in the other, and, and my granny said, you may sin under your own roof, but you're not gonna sin under mine. That's a difficult circumstance. That's making a judgment. They weren't casting judgment on a person. They were making a judgment that they were gonna stand for the truth. They loved unconditionally. That's not judging a person. That's making a judgment of what's best in the circumstance. We pray consistently. We love unconditionally. And then we trust God with everything. When we have a difficult family situation, when we have a prodigal child, we may want to control it, we may want to have our hand in it, we we may want to alter the circumstance, but we trust God's sovereignty is the absolute best path. So many times we want to alter everything around us. We want to micromanage everything that is going on around us, especially with our children. But oftentimes we just sit back and we trust I said that the, the father in the, in the story of the prodigal son, he didn't go off and search for his son. 
He didn't send provisions for his son. He didn't send his servants out to spy on his son to make sure he was safe. He waited at home, praying, loving, and trusting the heavenly father that he would call his son home. We trust God when we walk through the difficult times. We trust in God's perfect plan. We trust so much. If we're following God and pursuing God, then we rest in Romans 8, 28, that all things work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. We trust that God's plan is perfect. Even when our children, our siblings, or someone in our family is walking away from God's plan, we trust that God will allow them the grace and the forgiveness and the call of his Holy Spirit to come home, to come to their senses and to journey home to Christ, then to us. We as parents and as, and as family that are trying to pursue Christ, we need to realize that that broken or that prodigal family member, the most important thing for them is their relationship with Jesus. I think oftentimes we selfishly think, no, it's mend our relationship. Make us whole again as a family so that I can post a perfect Thanksgiving picture on social media and everybody can see how perfect of a family we are. There is no perfect family. Stop trying to spin your wheels and achieve that. Pray for them to come home to Christ. Pray for them to come to their senses and seek God's plan for their life. We trust in God's Sovereignty. And then the fourth thing that we must do, stand. We stand on God's truth. We stand for God's principles. We stand for the obedience that God calls us to. That may be the most difficult thing because what I've seen over the last 20 years is when people have someone close to them, especially a child, who makes a decision to live a life that is contrary to this word, but is embraced and endorsed by our culture. That when it's someone close to us, we start questioning this word and accepting their sinful behavior. We start ignoring God's truth and embracing the culture's picture of what it thinks is true what it thinks is politically correct. And when we do that, we add to the fault of our families. We add to the crumbling of the foundation that is the truth found in God's word. We stand as ambassadors for Christ. We have to know what this truth says and we have to live it out in the midst of our families. It is important for every one of us to go to our workplaces, to go out into our communities, to go into our schools, and to be the light of Jesus Christ. But it is more important for us to light our families with the truth of the gospel of Christ. It is most important that we shine the brightest in our homes when people are walking, when people are doubting, when they're, when they're being a prodigal and they're leaving the home for the far country, that we stand firm in the truth found in God's word, that we shine the brightest for the family members who are looking for your love, your unconditional love, your truth found in God's word and God's word alone. It is important that we pray, that we love, that we trust. But if we do those things without standing in the midst of broken families, of being the examples and the lights that our families need for us to live out, to be the example, to stand for truth. God will be honored, families restored, when people see the light of Christ in you. This Thanksgiving, this Christmas, every day, as you stand for truth, in your families. The story of the prodigal ends like this. The prodigal son was off in the distant country. He had squandered all of his wealth in loose living. Took a job serving in pigs and was so hungry because of famine in the land that he was on his hands and knees eating with the pigs. For a Jewish boy, there would be, there'd be no other, low, there'd be no lower place. 
And then it says, and he came to his senses. His parents didn't bring him back. Rock bottom brought him back. He came to his senses. He asked forgiveness to his heavenly father. And then he started the long journey home. Not weeks, months of walking and contemplating what he had done, where the decisions that he had made, the wealth that he had squandered, the sin that he was living in. And the greatest picture of the story, the father on the porch, looking, longing, praying for his son to come to his senses and come home. And in the distance he sees Not the son that took all the wealth and left months or years prior. But a broken, dirty son. And what did the father do? The father ran. The father ran and he embraced his son. And he hugged him and he kissed him and he said, I'm going to throw a celebration. I'm going to throw a party for you. Because my son that was lost, he's now home. He has returned not only to his heavenly father, but to his earthly father. And we as parents can pray for that for our children. Notice that father didn't run up and go, I can't believe you squandered the wealth. I told you if you left, I told you. He just embraced him and he loved him and he celebrated his return. This Thanksgiving, we can pray, we can love, we can trust, and we can stand. And when God's perfect timing. We can welcome that prodigal son, that prodigal parent, that prodigal sibling, that person who needs to know Christ. We can welcome them home with a celebration and an embrace that not only do we on earth get to celebrate, but there is a party in heaven when the prodigal returns home. Don't battle alone. Don't blame yourself, but this week prepare to pray, to love, to trust, to stand in the midst of your family who needs a picture of grace, of love, of mercy, and of truth. And when you do that, in God's perfect timing, that member that is broken or severed relationship of your family may come to their senses and come home.